This time we have our guest here, and uh, our guest is Dr. Marisa Shaw. Uh, she's a BSC and a naturopathic doctor. And she uh, was educated at the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine, a premier institute for education and research in naturopathic medicine. Before pursuing her career in naturopathic medicine, Dr. Schoen obtained her Bachelor of Science with distinction, majoring in biology from the University of Victoria, so she's very much a local person. Um, through her passion for education, Dr. Schoen reads leads by example and hopes to empower others to choose positive lifestyles in order to live optimally. And this certainly applies to those of us who have gone through the journey with prostate cancer and are encouraged daily to make sure we get exercise, make sure we eat well. And so it's very important that we have uh, speakers of our, our nature speaking to us and reminding us what we can do for ourselves. Uh, Dr. Shaw. Four years ago. Oh, only three, four. <laughs> um, so I have tried to drum up as much um, new information as possible, but as most of you are new to this presentation, um, you'll see that uh, I will cover a lot because I am a naturopathic physician. Um, I do a lot with the foundation, and what I mean by foundation is um, what Ron was saying is exercise, stress management. I'm going to speak a lot about nutrition. Um, because obviously that all plays a very, very large role. And then we're, we're also going to focus on um, some uh, nice complementary um, therapies as far as supplements that are very important um, as far as cancer therapy. Uh, so one thing I just wanted to mention also, um, I've, I've been in clinical practice for just over 10 years. I had a clinical practice in Sydney. Um, I've just recently moved my practice to Cordova Bay. Um, to a brand new integrative um, medical center. So I am now working um, alongside uh, physios, chiros, acupuncture, massage, um, and it's a really great team of, of practitioners. Um, how many people are familiar with uh, naturopathic medicine or naturopathic doctors? Have any of you visited a naturopathic doctor before? Okay, many of you. So I just thought I would go through the principles of naturopathic medicine um, and I think the first principle, first do no harm, I think, is pretty much the principle of most healthcare practitioners. Um, we really try to nourish the body, we try to empower people to really make positive lifestyle choices. We um, try to give the body the tools to really heal itself. Um, identify and treat the cause, that's another very, very big principle. So we're always looking at, okay, let's focus on the underlying root causes of the disease, and again, support the body as, as much as we can. Um, again, treat the whole person, so we're not just looking at isolated um, symptoms, but we're looking at the whole body. We're looking at stress levels, we're looking at sleep, we're looking at nutrition, we're looking at family history. Um, and I always like the, um, the last two, they kind of fit hand in hand. Uh, doctor is teacher and disease prevention and health promotion. And that's one of the biggest reasons why I became a naturopathic physician, um, because I truly believe that as doctors, we are here to teach you about you know, uh, making uh, good lifestyle choices, really um, empower you to learn more about what's going on in your body. And um, that's one of the reasons why I really enjoy lecturing, coming to you know, uh, <coughs> centers like the Prostate Center to really educate people about health and uh, wellness. Uh, so prostate cancer, the facts, um, 2016 facts. So prostate cancer remains the most common cancer diagnosed in Canadian men. Uh, one in eight Canadian men will develop prostate cancer in their uh, lifetime. Um, a lot of uh, the first few slides are probably a review for you as far as the prostate gland. I just thought I would throw that in there just as a review for anatomy. Um, but the prostate gland is a single donut-shaped gland about uh, the size of a walnut. 
and it does lie below the bladder and surrounds the urethra. Um, its major role is to secrete a very, very thin, milky, alkaline fluid that lubricates the urethra and forms part of the uh, seminal fluid that um, carries the sperm. Um, so the next one I'm going to go over really talks about the hormonal effects um, on the prostate. And there's some conflicting information out there um, as far as testosterone and the role that testosterone does play on prostate cancer. And I'm not saying that it's correct and it's not correct, but I just I always like to just put the information out there and maybe it'll drum up some discussion uh, later on. Uh, but when we do look at the hormone effects of um, the prostate, uh, it does come down to uh, testosterone metabolism. And I'll share just a few studies and information regarding um, testosterone because I think the big belief um, conventionally is that testosterone is the bad guy. Testosterone is the one that feeds the cancer, feeds specifically prostate cancer. Um, but no one really talks, or maybe few people talk about the importance of 5-alpha-DHT um, and then also these other metabolites and also estrogen. So the, all of these hormones actually play a very, very large role with regards to not just prostate cancer, um, but also um, female dominant cancers like breast cancer, um, uterine cancers, and especially the um, estradiol is very important. Um, but ultimately, our whole goal is to keep the, the testosterone levels in healthy amounts and prevent them from converting into dihydrotestosterone. And dihydrotestosterone is a very, very strong and a very potent um, bad testosterone. So we've got good testosterone and bad testosterone. And the thought is, is that this dihydrotestosterone is actually the one that is responsible for things like enlarged prostate, but also um, prostate cancer. So it's about manipulating that so that we're creating healthy levels of testosterone, the lower levels of this dihydrotestosterone. Uh, also, we want to prevent the conversion of testosterone into too much estrogen by an enzyme called aromatase. So that's the other thing that can happen within the human body. And then the, um, the metabolite called 3 beta um, adiol is a relatively new uh, testosterone metabolite that seems to have an actual protective role um, in the body. And this is actually a, a specific test that can be done through a lab that I use in my office called Meridian Valley, and you can actually look it up online as well. I put the website there for you. Um, but we actually will do this test to check with the hormonal metabolites to see, okay, what is somebody's uh, metabolic um, or uh, their risk for developing prostate cancer down the road or how their treatments might be doing as well. So 5-alpha reductase is the enzyme that actually converts the testosterone into the 5-alpha um, dihydrotestosterone. Remember the dihydrotestosterone uh, is three times as potent as testosterone, and as I mentioned, might be one of the primary contributing factors to prostate uh, cancer growth. And then I did mention the 3-beta-adiol um, is actually a protective metabolite. So we actually want large amounts of this specific metabolite in the body because it's an anti-carcinogen. So it actually um, helps to protect the prostate gland from things like um, prostate cancer to maintain healthy cells within the prostate gland. Um, I often get a lot of questions about these types of testing, so this type of metabolite testing. Um, I get a lot of men that come in and they'll say, okay, well, you know, I've had my testosterone levels checked, but I've read that there's much more than just getting your testosterone levels checked. Um, and so that's why, you know, when we talk about testosterone, um, you really want to look at the total and the free um, testosterone levels. So total meaning all the testosterone that's floating around in the body, um, but then you've got some testosterone that's floating around, but then you've also got um, testosterone that's bound, that's more bioavailable, that's going to be attached to the receptor. So when you're asking for testosterone levels, it's very important to check all these different um, sequ sequences of testing as well as the sex hormone binding globulin to look at the full picture. If you're just looking at total testosterone and you're not looking at the metabolites, it's really not giving you the full picture of what's going on. 
Um, so really interesting research that was done about testosterone and prostate cancer by um, a fellow mate by the name of Renaud. And he did a lot of extensive um, research and reviews about the subject of, okay, is testosterone really responsible for causing prostate cancer, or are there a lot of other things that we really need to be aware of and that we need to look at? Um, but his conclusions were that men with lower testosterone levels actually have a higher um, rate of prostate cancer, significantly higher rates of high-grade advanced cancers. So again, if you're not looking at the whole picture, if you're not looking at those testosterone metabolites, like that DHT, which is really responsible for um, prostate cancer, one of the, the root causes, um, then again, you're not looking at the whole picture. And, he also said that lower testosterone levels were associated with a greater risk of non-organ confined prostate cancer. Higher levels of androgens are actually protective for the prostate cancer, and there's a very, very large study that showed that. So again, making sure that we've got healthy, normal levels of testosterone and preventing that testosterone from creating those bad guys, those bad metabolites. You know, I've, I've never heard that before, and I've read extensively on prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. I, I'm amazed that I don't know it. I mean, I've read a lot of books mm -hmm. and the center and all that. Kind of yeah, well, you'll see that our, like, as a naturopathic physician, we treat very differently than conventional medical doctors. And I'm not saying that there's, there's a wrong or there's a right. We just have a very different way of supporting the body. And these are, in, in my opinion, when, I'm, when I see somebody who's coming in that's concerned because they have a family history or they've been diagnosed, doing these tests will give me more information so that I know, okay, these are the nutrients, and we'll go through some of those nutrients that help to actually prevent that testosterone from converting. But with regards to conventional medicine, you know, they have their, they're within their scope of practice, and then my scope of practice is very different. And there's no right or wrong. It's just a different way of approaching the, the so topic. A logical outcome for what you just said is that if you've got, before you have prostate cancer, if you have testosterone boosting procedures done, you reduce your risk of prostate cancer, no? Well, there's different opinions of that. I wouldn't say, like, go and get yourself on some andro gel and, you know, put it all over yourself. Like, it's it very. Me. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's. You have to look at all the different pieces of the puzzle. It's. It's not as simple as that. It's just giving you some sort of food for thought to look at. Okay, well, if this is something you know, if you've been diagnosed with prostate cancer, maybe looking at the whole picture and looking at. Okay, well, where are my levels of DHT? Am I converting into more of the harmful testosterone? Okay, if I am, then there are actually some vitamins and minerals that I can take or herbs to help with that. And that's where some of the drugs will do that too. But then as we know, a lot of the drugs that are out there have a lot of side effects associated with them. Um, this was something else actually that was done um, by another uh, a doctor by the name of Dr. Morgan Taylor. And he actually, you're right, he actually did testosterone treatment with um, men with prostate cancer. Um, and they weren't doing any treatment of cancer at that time, but they treated the testosterone, um, treated them with testosterone replacement therapy, and I'm sure they were being monitored very closely, but the mean PSA actually did not change and there was no progression of the um, prostate cancer. Um, so, and they were also doing low levels, so again, they weren't, you know, boosting people with huge amounts of testosterone, and they were probably doing a lot of monitoring as far as their metabolites as well. <clears throat> So the conclusions, again, just some food for thought. Um, does testosterone really cause prostate cancer? Um, if testosterone really was the only cause of prostate cancer, then why are we not seeing huge rises of prostate cancer when, when testosterone is at its peak in men that are in their 20s, right? So again, just thinking more about, okay, what are the other factors that are involved here? What are the metabolites? Is it, is it our environment too, which I'm actually gonna spend a lot of time talking about just all the chemicals that we're being exposed to. Pesticides, insecticides, all these hormone disruptors, plastics, um, they, I believe, are having a huge impact on not just the rate of prostate cancer, but just cancer um, in general as a whole. <clears throat> 
Um, I'm also just going to focus a little bit on just estrogen because men do have estrogen as well as women. Um, but as I mentioned, and as you saw on that chart before, um, testosterone will convert into estrogen. And so there is a theory that, oh, is there, is it because there's more estrogen, bad estrogen in the body, that's also causing abnormal cell growth? Um, high estrogen, we know, is also responsible for a lot of women that get the belly fat, but it's also, it also contributes to the belly fat in, um, in men as well. And they also found that higher estrogen levels, especially the high bad estrogen metabolites, are also associated with much greater risk of heart disease and early um, death. So there was another study that actually found that men with the higher levels of estrogen experienced 133% greater risk of death. So again, even more reason to really look at where your metabolites, where things are converting uh, in the body. <clears throat> So the thought is, is that could estrogen, high levels of estrogen, be a risk factor for developing prostate cancer as well? So where is a lot of this high, these high estrogens coming from? Well, I mentioned a lot of them already. But some of the preventative strategies are minimizing our exposure to environmental toxins. So we call these things xenoestrogens or xenobiotics. So these chemicals are very, very smart in that they have the ability to actually mimic and disrupt our own natural hormone pathways in the body. Um, I am also going to talk a little bit about stress management. We're going to talk a lot about lifestyle diet modifications and then also the root of most chronic disease, which is inflammation. And a lot of that can come from uh, stress, but it also can come from what we're putting uh, into our bodies. Uh, when we look at the toxins that we're being exposed to, um, living in a toxic soup, as they say, uh, over 21 billion pounds of toxic chemicals are released into the environment by industries every year, and over 4.5 billion pounds are recognized carcinogens, so what that means is they're very, very toxic and very harmful uh, to our health. So what are some of these chemicals, um, what do these chemicals look like? So we're talking about things like bisphenol A, also known as BPA, so found in plastics, found in the lining of cans. Um, heavy metals that are found all over the place in our water, in the air, mercury, amalgams, <laughs> lead paints. Um, phthalates and parabens, they're found in most beauty products, deodorants, aftershave, cologne, toothpaste, all of it, all the commercially um, store-bought things. Uh, pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, um, and dioxins also. Now, I just found actually labs that are able to test for all of these, which is kind of neat. So it actually can test the body burden of these environmental toxins. So it'll test for the levels of phthalates and parabens and dioxins and heavy metals and, and BPA, which is new, new research and new, new testing, which I think is really, really important. Um, so you probably are looking at this list thinking, oh my goodness, like I, what am I supposed to eat and what am I supposed to use and you know, we're bombarded by all these chemicals. Um, and I'm not here to, to freak all of you out, but I'm just here to just make sure you're thinking a little bit more about what you're actually putting into your body and also what you're putting on your body. So, you know, the health food stores here in Victoria, I think we're very, very lucky. Um, we've got a great selection of great health food stores. And a lot of these health food stores have done their research in carrying really good products as far as shampoos and shaving creams and deodorants and things like that to make sure that they don't have these types of chemicals in there. Because if you just think about it, if we keep putting more and more of these toxins in the body, how is the body actually able to uh, get rid of abnormal cell growth, or deal with inflammation, or make sure that the brain's healthy and the digestion is healthy, and, it's, and your body's able to absorb its nutrients as well. So lifestyle and diet, guidelines for a healthy diet, and some of these things might seem very common sense to you when you look at the list, um, but I think we really underestimate how diet does play a huge role with general health. And also for people that are going through chemo and radiation, um, you know, how do we support the body to do so? You know, do we support the body to do that by drinking, you know, Coca-Cola or eating lots of sweets? No, we want to feed the body with, you know, 
fruits and vegetables and good fiber and lots of water. And you know, having those things once in a while as a treat, but you know, we really want to make sure that we keep the body really as strong as possible. So limiting, limiting hydrogenated and trans fats. So you know, fish and chips, hamburgers, things like that. But again, if you're going to a family barbecue and you're having that as a treat once in a while, I'll say, you know what, that's fine. But it's everything in moderation, right? Increase your good fats. Um, fiber is actually a really, really important one, and I'm going to show you another um, slide in just one moment about fiber um, and how it actually applies to cancer. Um, but fiber is important also because it enables you to really um, eliminate those toxins through the bowel. So the more fiber you have in the um, in your diet, the more you're going to actually <coughs> bind onto those chemicals and those environmental toxins and eliminate them safely out of the body. So. Things like psyllium, ground flax, chia seeds, hemp hearts, ogran, um, lots of fruits and veggies. Those are all really, really great sources of fiber. I mentioned increase your fruits and veggies, adequate fluids. Um, limit red meat and dairy um, are very, very important concepts as well. And I'll um, show you a really interesting slide just in a moment on um, dairy and cancer. Uh, refined sugars. There's so much information now coming out about how deadly sugar is, and how sugar is essentially found in everything. Um, so I really do a lot of, uh, I spend a lot of time with my patients just teaching them about what to look for on labels. What are you looking for when you're looking at a label? Well, obviously things like store-bought cookies are going to have a lot of sugar in them, um, but even things like flavored yogurts. You know, there's a lot of sugar in flavored yogurts, and they're not usually putting good sugar in there, like natural fruit. They're usually putting glucose and fructose and, and other things and other preservatives to keep the yogurt from spoiling. Uh, things like ketchup, things like pasta sauces have a lot of added sugar to them. So just some, some easy um, substitutes. You know, if you really love yogurt, get plain organic yogurt and put fresh fruit in it instead of getting the flavored. Um, refined sugar uh, yogurts. Um, limit alcohol consumption. Exercise, don't smoke obviously, and eat organic as much as you can. And I know it's expensive to eat organic 24-7. I realize that. Um, but that's why things like the Environmental Working Group, I put up the website earlier, ewg.org, has some really, really great um, resources and handouts that will actually teach you about which fruits and vegetables actually have the highest pesticide residue versus the fruits and vegetables that actually have the lowest pesticide residue. So does anyone want to take a guess at the fruits and vegetables that have, which fruits and vegetables have the highest pesticide residue? Which ones do you kind of, you definitely want to be buying organic if you can? Grapes. Yeah. <coughs> Apples, yes. Celery. Celery. Strawberries. Celery. Yeah. Coffee. Yes, coffee and teas. Yeah. So there are definitely things that are going to have more pesticide residues or sprayed more often, and all the things that the things that people just mentioned are on the Environmental Working Group website. Again, ewg.org. They've got a little wallet guide that you can take with you to the grocery store and it'll show you the list of the ones that are high and the ones that are low. So things like um, that have a very tough skin, like avocados, if you don't buy them organic, it's not the end of the world because they have a fairly low pesticide residue. So these are just some tips for just when you're grocery shopping, how you can really minimize that exposure to excess pesticides and things like that. I know right now in the winter time it's hard to get local as well, but we we have a huge selection of local farms here in the summer, where you can get a really nice array of, of beautiful, um, especially vegetables and some fruits. Ah, so dairy and cancer. Um, so this is a really interesting study, um, Harvard's Physicians Health Study. They followed 20,000 men for 11 years, finding that. These men that had two and a half dairy servings each day increased prostate cancer risk by 34%. So the thought is, is that dairy products increase um, insulin-like growth factor, which in turn promotes cancer growth. Um, I've been reading a lot more information regarding dairy, and I don't want to be sort of a, you know, say too much bad news regarding dairy because there are some, some positive things as well about dairy. 
Um, but the more that I read, if you think about when the cow is being milked, right? How often is the cow pregnant while it's being milked? Usually, on average, these cows are pregnant for 300 days of the year. And if you think about where their hormone levels are at when they're pregnant, and we're milking the cow, and then we're drinking all the milk and the yogurt and the cheese, and we're essentially consuming those high levels of estrogens, right? Just like when a woman is pregnant, her estrogen levels peak. Just like in a woman or a female cow, their estrogen levels are going to peak as well. So that is one big thing that I think is a contributing factor to a lot of um, issues that women are experiencing, but also increasing the estrogen in men. But also the insulin-like growth factor is found in large amounts in dairy. So really, really watch your consumption. I'm not saying you have to cut all of it out, but if you're drinking, you know, a few glasses of milk and you're having cheese and crackers and you're having a couple of yogurts a day, that's that's a lot of dairy. And dairy does tend to be inflammatory in nature as well. So if we're trying to reduce the root cause, reduce inflammation in the body, get the body stronger, um, then that's also something to think about. Uh, yes. What is this Sullivan? What is? Um, mentioned two and a half daily servings. What would you call a serving? I would say serving would be like a cup. Yeah, that's the general rule. It's a serving is a cup of something. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned the importance of fiber. Um, for a number of reasons, and one of the biggest reasons, as I mentioned, is fiber does bind to toxic compounds and carcinogens, so toxic chemicals, um, and then they help. It helps to to eliminate um, these chemicals uh, through the body and through the bowels, um, and then it also helps to bind any harmful hormones in the body as well. So they have found that increasing your fiber will help to bind onto any of those harm harmful estrogens or even harmful testosterone metabolites as well. Um, this next one that I found actually on flax seeds. How many people like eat flax seeds? Oh, good. Well, a study actually highlighted the effect of lignans, which are found in flax seeds, on tumor proliferation. They actually found that the lignans found in flax seeds, but also they're found in some legumes, brassica. What are the brassica vegetables? Broccoli. Broccoli, cauliflower, kale, cabbage. Um, and seeds may reduce the aggressiveness of an already existing tumor. So when you actually have the prostate cancer or any kind of cancer, it actually helps to um, decrease that aggressiveness as well. I mean, flax seeds, you can add that to anything. You can add that to your oatmeal, yogurt, in moderation, um, smoothies. You can use it in your baking as well. Again, I'm just going to reiterate fruits and veggies because I just don't think we get enough of them in our diet. Um, but there have been a numerous studies that have shown that the consumption of both fruits and vegetables protects against the development of various types of cancer, um, including prostate. Uh, and then they also found that um, some of the ones that were, that were noted to have the most protectiveness were the, the allium vegetables, so onions, garlic, and leeks, carrots, the green vegetables, again, the cruciferous vegetables, very, very important. Um, one of the reasons, too, why the cruciferous vegetables are so important is because they contain compounds, for example, indole-3-carbonyl, which I'll mention in a later slide, sulforaphane, um, DIM, calcium deglucurate. So these are all compounds that are found in very, very large amounts in these cruciferous vegetables, and that's what makes them so powerful in that they can actually um, uh, stop abnormal cell growth and also reduce the... the um, the uh, increased levels of these bad hormones in the body. Uh, yes. Uh, I've noticed that at the bottom there it said tomatoes. Uh, I'm under the impression that tomatoes need to be heated to be better. For lead lipoprotein, you mean? Uh, I'm not too sure. I, I, I just, in all the information that I read, uh, I, I read that. If tomatoes are, are raw, they're not as good as they're not as effective been, from the <laughs> Yeah, you do want to cook them a little bit. It's not to say that like raw tomatoes aren't going to have any nutritional um, yeah. value at all. But one thing that I will mention about tomatoes, um, 
from an inflammatory perspective, they do belong to the nightshade family. So for some people that have chronic inflammation um, or say arthritis or rheumatoid or some kind of underlying inflammatory disease, um, they actually don't respond as well to tomatoes per se. How, how we're saying that, um, tomatoes are actually rich in a compound called lycopene that's very protective for the prostate. Um, but I always say you're better off actually taking lycopene as a supplement than eating 10 tomatoes a day. It's just like vitamin C in oranges, right? You're better off actually taking a vitamin C supplement than eating you know, 10 or 15 oranges in a day because you're also getting a lot of sugar um, in the oranges as well. But yeah, if you are having the tomatoes, it's better to have them slightly um, cooked, like in a tomato sauce or something like that. But yeah. Um, essential fatty acids, another mainstay in my clinical practice. Um, but what's very important with the omegas is the balance between um, omega 3s and omega 6s. So omega 6s are mostly found in our animal proteins, right? So chicken, um, some meat. Uh, butter, whole milk, eggs, um, egg yolks especially, some of our vegetable oils. And then omega-3s are very, very protective in that they help to decrease inflammation, but they're mostly only found in um, fish and then also flax. Um, so the ratio is very, very important when we talk about the sixes and nines um, because we mostly have too much sixes in the diet versus three. So it's really about making sure that we're readjusting that ratio and getting more of the protective good omega-3s that are going to help to decrease inflammation and also protect the heart and protect the brain and then help to not only need to cut out all the omega-6s but just help to decrease them so that our, our diet isn't rich, rich with too much animal protein. <clears throat> Um, there was an interesting study back in 2013 that showed that high blood plasma phospholipids was actually protective against prostate cancer when the fish oil was consumed as well, so I just wanted to note that. Um, so some of the complementary therapies, now there's a lot of them, um, and I'm just going to try to focus on, like these, I know that there are some that you're thinking that aren't on the list, um, which I did talk about last time, so I tried to pick some new ones to kind of focus on. Um, in this list, things like resveratrol and curcumin, there's a lot of new information coming out regarding uh, curcumin, which is turmeric. Um, but as I mentioned, um, lycopene, so lycopene is found, as I mentioned, in tomatoes, but it's also found in banana and pink grapefruit. Um, very, very high antioxidant activity, helps to protect the immune system. Um, and a study published by the members of the Department of the Epidemiology at the Harvard School of Public Health stated that the strongest known dietary risk factor for prostate cancer is lycopene um, deficit. So not having enough of that really protective antioxidant in the body. So you can take um, lycopene, you can get it from tomatoes, but your best bet is actually getting it from um, supplementing the dosage is 6 to 60 milligrams daily. Um, depending on the aggressiveness of your cancer, I'd probably dose it higher um, than do a minimal, uh, minimal amount. Hmm. Vitamin D. Vitamin D is a, a, one of those up-and-coming well, up vitamins that I think we're not getting enough of, especially from where we live. Um, but vitamin D is a big one when it comes to protecting against cancer or even with um, cancer treatment. Uh, it's suggested that even regarding um, increased prostate risk is actually associated with uh, a decreased production of vitamin D in the body. So vitamin D is kind of labeled as the sunshine um, vitamin. We do produce it ourselves, but as you guessed, you know, living in, um, even though we live in a beautiful part of the country, um, especially our winters tend to be quite gray. So we're not going to produce enough of the vitamin D. Um, if we're not getting a lot of sunshine, because it relies on sunshine for our body to produce it. Uh, in my experience, and I actually even did an experiment on myself, um, with myself taking vitamin D at 3,000, 4,000 IUs per day, and then testing my vitamin D levels, and I was nowhere near being in toxic levels. So there is that concern because it's a fat-soluble vitamin. Okay, well, how do I know I'm not reaching toxicity levels in the body? 
you can get your vitamin D levels checked. Um, but in my experience with most of my patients, a lot of my patients are taking anywhere between, and this is a conservative dosage, um, but anywhere between four, six, eight thousand IU a day. I've never had any issues um, in my practice with any of my patients. <clears throat> and it depends also on the medical history. If you're fighting like inflammation, if you're fighting cancer, if you're fighting some kind of immune deficiency, you're going to be using more of that vitamin. You need more of that vitamin. Same thing with osteoporosis or osteopenia. You need more because there's a deficiency in the body. The body requires more of specific vitamins. <clears throat> High doses of IV vitamin C. Um, so one of the standard um, treatments or protocols with most naturopathic physicians um, with not just prostate cancer but any type of cancer is to dose high doses of IV vitamin C treatments. Um, and the thought is with IV vitamin C, we know that it is a very, very potent antioxidant. It's immune stimulatory, so it's going to help to stimulate those white blood cells, help to protect against a lot of um, bad bacteria and viruses. Um, but it also has been found to stimulate collagen synthesis, which could potentially enhance the body's capacity to encapsulate a tumor, so prevent it from spreading. Um, they also have noted that oral administration of 10 grams a day can improve the quality of life, relieve pain, prolong survival, um, and then also induce remission in some types of cancers. Um, in a study by Cam uh, Linus Pauling and Cameron, they actually did some studies with um, uh, patients with terminal cancer that were actually treated with 10 grams a day intravenously and also 10 grams a day orally. And they did found that the survival time was actually um, increased in the vitamin C group. Now vitamin C um, taken orally, uh, for some, if you're doing high, high doses, um, can really be hard to tolerate uh, because it can cause diarrhea in high, high doses. And that's why we always recommend doing the IV vitamin C, because with IV vitamin C, you're completely bypassing the bowels, you're bypassing the digestive system. So you essentially can dose up to 50, 75, 100 grams of vitamin C intravenously without it actually affecting the bowels in a negative manner. Uh, you would never be able to take 50 grams, of, that's 50,000 milligrams of vitamin C orally. It would just be too hard on the whole digestive system. Um, so generally, high doses of IV vitamin C are, are quite well um, tolerated. Uh, and I did mention there, those are the doses. And um, how it works, actually, is the thought is that it actually increases hydrogen peroxide in the tissues, which will selectively bind onto and kill uh, cancer cells through oxidative stress to those cancer cells. So it protects the good cells and the good white blood cells and the immune cells, but it actually selectively will kill um, the cancer cells. And there's more information on this um, website here, integratedhealthclinic.com, um, and more information on uh, the vitamin C treatments. Uh, as a little bit of an aside, too, with, with vitamin C, um, a lot of information now is coming out with vitamin C um, and lysine and heart disease um, and decreasing inflammation and helping to reduce um, bad cholesterol uh, as well. <clears throat> mistletoe. Uh, how many people have heard of mistletoe treatments? <laughs> I know you've heard of mistletoe, which is Christmas, but what about mistletoe treatments from the actual mistletoe plant? So it's actually a treatment um, that comes from Germany, um, and it's been around for many, many years. Uh, I've actually recently have had a couple of my patients that have traveled to um, Europe for um, some cancer treatments, where they've, they've done um, mistletoe treatments as well as vitamin C and other things. Um, but a lot of the naturopathic doctors, um, as well as myself, uh, do use mistletoe in certain cases. And what it is, is it's actually their mistletoe injections. So you don't take the mistletoe orally, but they're actually subcutaneous injections. And the theory behind it is that the mistletoe contains many, many, actually a thousand different constituents, things like lectins, viscotoxins, flavonoids, um, vitamin C. So all these things that are very, very protective, again, for the immune system to help it fight cancer. So boosts immunity, induces apoptosis, so that's cell death within the cancer, 
and results in the inhibition of tumor growth. So these are all the things that um, people respond to or will say as far as when they're getting the mistletoe treatments and they are doing treatments, say, radiation and chemotherapy. Um, but less fatigue, less side effects from the conventional treatments, less nausea, improved appetite, less pain sensation, less frequent and um, depressive moods as well. How so often, that is how that. often do you have the injection? <laughs> So what I've done in the past is um, I you have to get that you can't um, order this online or anything. You have to have it through a naturopathic doctor. And so what I've done in the past is I actually will teach my patients to inject themselves, and um, so that you don't have to keep coming in all the time. Um, but basically, I order the little vials, and then I'll teach my patients. And you just pick up insulin needles from the drugstore, a little sharps container, some little um, alcohol swabs. And then I teach my patients to give themselves subcutaneous um, injections. Depending on um, the stage of the cancer, um, depending on the vitality of the patient, there's different series um, that you can start on. And um, essentially, they suggest doing it um, three times a week. So, CoQ10. Uh, is a very, very important antioxidant as well. Um, very important, we kind of think of CoQ10 as an important one for the heart, right? For blood pressure, to prevent heart disease, if you're on any statin medications. Um, but actually, CoQ10 is a really important one um, for cancer as well. Um, also, for any kind of periodontal disease, even neurological diseases. Some newer research is coming out even on um, infertility from men, for men and for women. Um, but this is an interesting one. I know it's not specific to um, prostate cancer, um, but this is melanoma, and they received 400 milligrams of CoQ10 after five years. Significantly fewer patients in the CoQ10 group had um, developed metastases, so it actually had prevented it from spreading elsewhere uh, in the body. So 300 to 400 milligrams um, daily. Uh, Turmeric also known as curcumin, um, is a really, I'm actually quite excited about um, curcumin because of so much of the new research that's coming out regarding uh, not only cancer, but also cognitive functioning, Alzheimer's disease. They're now looking at, okay, is cognitive um, decline, is that related to inflammation in the brain, right? So specific to the brain, where um, turmeric actually plays a role, because turmeric has very, very um, strong, potent um, properties to decrease inflammation in the body, and it's a very, very strong uh, antioxidant as well. Um, there was a specific study that I found um, regarding curcumin and um, prostate cancer, and they found that curcumin alone inhibited 20% of the production of prostate-specific antigen, so that's a biomarker for inflammation in the prostate and prostate cancer. Um, they also found that um, uh, curcumin can also um, help to increase apoptosis, so again, destroy um, specific uh, tumors um, or compounds that will destroy um, cancer tumors uh, in the body. Um, curcumin, though, is one of those um, herbs that is not um, indicated if you are going through chemotherapy. So if you're going through any kind of um, conventional treatment such as chemotherapy, uh, you shouldn't be taking curcumin or you should be monitored very, very closely. So to, to American curcumin are the same thing, right? Curcumin is like the active um, bioavailable component of turmeric. So some of you might be thinking, okay, well, I'll just um, add some turmeric spice to my curcumin. I'll just eat curry three times a week or something like that, or add a little bit of uh, turmeric in my smoothie. So that's not, a, I mean, that, those are good good suggestions, um, but when I'm talking about curcumin, I'm talking about a very, very, like, the active constituent, you can only get it in a supplement form where they, it's been standardized and, and it's a specific extract. So I read, I read that in one study, the, uh, uh, the proportion of patients undergoing medicine metastasis was significantly reduced if you took regular terms of the supplement. Just tumor spice? No, the, the, the supplement. Oh, yeah. Costco supplement. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's there's so many different forms of the turmeric in, in on the market. I don't know that there've been a ton of studies like comparing like the actual spice in itself, but anything that you're going to find as far as turmeric that's in a supplement is a standardized extract. Yeah. You're saying here that 20% of the production of PSA um, yeah. would be inhibited by taking the, the turmeric. Um, so is that uh, the same as the, that's not the same as the turmeric drinking, is it? Is it no, but that's where the this one. results of your testing? Or? That's where this one comes into play. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I it's, an, indi it's an indication that, okay, the PSA went down in 20%. So... And these were people that were already that already had found like there was already prostate cancer there. So the thought is okay if it was decreasing the PSA, decreasing inflammation. So the thought is okay well, if there's less inflammation. So are you saying then that, that it's this other thing that it's doing, which as a result of that, the PSA goes down because there's less tumor. Is that, is that the le less tumor, yeah. Less tumor, so you get less PSA. Yeah. Because that should be a little bit the other way around because it's the difference. Oh, sorry. I asked Steinoff about it, and he said he didn't have any problem with, with his patients taking it. Oh, perfect. Like during chemo and all that? No, no, during radiation or, or surgery or hormone therapy. No. That's he great. Yeah. No, he didn't know much about it, mind you. But <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's a natural herb. They, they have it three times a day in India where the prostate cancer rate is 125th with the yeah. I've, I've been taking uh, Kirkman for a couple of years now, and I find that it, it's really helpful as an anti-inflammatory for arthritis. And yeah. Like that. And that's why I think a lot of people will start taking it because of like aches and pains, or their doctor says, oh, you have a little bit of OA in your knee or your shoulder. and. But, you know, as a, as a side, you know, it also is very protective for the immune system. It's a very, very potent and strong antioxidant. It also is really good for the liver, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This must be also good for theme. This is an anti-inflammatory. Is there a limit to the curriculum that you should? You know, it, I know, that's why I didn't put a dosage down, because there's different standardized extracts. So for me to just throw out, oh, 200 milligrams, it really depends on the type of standardized extract that you're taking, and there's many on the market. Um, one of the ones that I found that with the best um, results and practice, and you can get it in the health food store too, is called Theracumin, and it's a standardized extract that's by Natural Factors. And it has a lot of, if you look it up, it has a lot of studies from that specific standardized extract of um, curcumin. Uh, yeah. Turmeric and saffron. Is there any relationship with saffron? Uh, so that's a different herb. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as far as um, therapeutic properties, right. I know that there's um, some research that shows that saffron is really good from um, a nervous system perspective, but I'm not sure with regards to saffron in mm -hmm. cancer specific. Yeah. One of the most expensive wrong. materials to <laughs> selling price yeah. by weight. Yeah. Um, aside from chemotherapy, are there any other contraindications or um, drug interactions associated with curcumin that you know of? Um, warfarin. Yeah. So the thought is, is if people are on um, getting their INRs checked regularly and they're taking warfarin or coumadin, um, it's just something, again, you want to be monitored properly. It's not that you can take it, it's just you don't want to be taking high doses of, you know, you want to let your, your health care provider know. Yeah. Good if you have rats. Yeah. Um, Reservatrol. How many people have heard of Reservatrol before? Yeah, so it's, um, it's a type of polyphenol. It's a very, very strong antioxidant as well, and it's found in the skin of red grapes and berries. So a lot of my patients you know, when they hear that, they'll say, oh, does that mean I can drink a bottle of wine a week or, you know, a few glasses of wine? Um, you know, that's not what that means. Um, but, you know, wine or, you know, moderate a moderate amount of alcohol is okay. But, um, you know, if you're having an excess, so three, four glasses of wine a day, 
Um, and you have to look at sort of the whole picture as well. You know, if you've got poor kidney function, if you've got hypertension, if you're not sleeping very well, you know, there's, if you've got liver disease, you know, there are some factors that definitely play a role with, you know, how much alcohol you drink, obviously. But Reservatrol is actually, again, a standardized extract that you can take um, as a supplement. And it's been found actually to be very, very protective against many, many cancers, not just prostate, but breast, liver, pancreatic, gastric, melanoma, lung cancer, and colon. Um, again, they've highlighted it as a, it's apoptotic, an anti-proliferative, so it helps to keep the cancer intact. Um, and then it also is um, very, very deadly to cancer cells specific, so it makes um, them uh, pretty much destroy themselves. Uh, modified citrus pectin, um, in my opinion, is a really, really important one as well. Um, again, the modified citrus pectin actually interferes with angiogenesis. Do you know what angiogenesis means? Sounds dangerous. So, so angiogenesis means when the tumor grows to a point where it actually is starting to develop its own blood vessels and blood supply and getting like stealing nutrients from the body. So modified citrus pectin actually is shown to interfere with that. And in doing so, also interferes with the spread of the cancer. Um, they actually found specifically with prostate cancer that 70% 70, 70 of the men with prostate cancer who took 15 grams of MCP daily for one year had a significant de decline in PSA uh, doubling time. It also enhances the activity of natural killer cells, which are our immune system's defense mechanism against abnormal. Yes. I'd like to point out that that's, if you read that carefully, that's not a decrease in PSA, that's a decrease in the growth rate of PSA. Right. Just sort of misunderstood. Yeah. <laughs> sort of what I was trying to <laughs> So the growth, so okay, so the growth rate of the PSA, so meaning that indirectly it's affecting how quickly maybe the cancer is growing. But it's not specifically like saying that the cancer is gone or being cured or anything like that. Yeah. And 15 grams is a tablespoon? No, so the 15 grams, usually the modified citrus pectin does come in a powder. And usually in the powder, there's, to my knowledge, there's only two companies that will make the modified citrus pectin from the health food store. One company is called um, AOR, and the other company is called um, Pectisol C. And they come with little scoops, and so a scoop is five grams. So essentially you're doing one scoop three times a day, mixed in a little bit of water or mixed in with um, a smoothie or um, you know, blended up in a, in a blender with some juice. Um, plant sterols is another big one. Uh, it's also known for um, enlarged prostate disease as well, but also has um, been shown to have very, very, uh, very, very strong immunomodulating um, properties. Uh, again, the induction of apoptosis, so programmed cell death in cancers, cancer cells. Um, and then also, remember we talked about uh, blocking the conversion of testosterone into the dihydrotestosterone, so that more um, potent, stronger form of testosterone. So it's found that the beta sterol <coughs> in the plant sterols will help with that. It works on that specific uh, enzyme at 200 to 300 milligrams daily. Uh, green tea extract is another uh, really, really potent um, antioxidant, uh, not just specific to prostate cancer, but also for many other cancers. It's anti-inflammatory, um, also I mentioned an antioxidant, um, helps to support normal cell development, um, and this is the actual specific um, standardized extract that you want to make sure is in your green tea extract if you're going to be taking it. Um, so it's the, sorry, but EGCG, um, and it's anywhere between 500 to 1500 milligrams daily. So you want to make sure that it actually has that component. You're not just buying green tea extract, but it doesn't say anywhere on the label the standardized or how much of that um, component is in there. 
Uh, indole 3 carbonyl, um, I mentioned with the brassica family, so broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower. So indole 3 carbonyl is one of those active constituents that is found um, in those groups of vegetables. Um, and what it does is it's anti-estrogenic in a way that it actually will attach to the bad estrogens, those bad estrogen metabolites or excess estrogen in the body. Um, they've also found that it has been able to, again, induce apoptosis in human prostate cancer cells. Um, one of the metabolites of I3C, also called DIM, which is also found in all your brassica vegetables, um, has also been found to inhibit, again, that production of that more potent and harm harmful form of um, testosterone. But it's also been shown to be very protective in things like breast cancer, colon, um, and cervical cancer as well, so two to 400. Uh, milligrams daily. <coughs> ah, and last but not least, pomegranate. Um, pomegranate is actually uh, a very, very, again, very um, anti powerful antioxidant. Um, also induces uh, or increases glutathione in the body. I'm not sure if you're familiar with what glutathione is, um, but a glutathione is uh, a very protective antioxidant that we manufacture ourselves. And so it helps to upregulate um, that specific antioxidant in the body to protect our, our good cells. Uh, also anti-inflammatory, also anti-carcinogenic. Um, and the compounds that are found in the pomegranate peel have shown to have effects against um, cancer as well, specifically to inhibit the growth of human prostate uh, cancer cells. Um, so, using pomegranate, um, I've even actually recommended, I know, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the palm juice that you can get, like that, um, it's called POM, pomegranate juice that you can get. Um, some of my patients will use that and they'll mix their MCP, their modified citrus pectin, in with their pomegranate juice. Um, or they'll dilute it, or you can even get pomegranate as um, an extract, or just eat it as the fruit as well. Well, I was in Vancouver Christmas time. My uh, daughter brought out a pomegranate. It's the first time I've had one. And uh, we broke off some of the seeds. She didn't eat the skin. I said, well, what do you do with these seeds that are, you know, inside the, uh, inside the, the flesh? Oh, you just chew them up, she said. <laughs> I don't know. They're delicious. And, um, yeah, they're super good. They cook properly. So I don't know whether that's good you for you. You can make not. a sauce. You can make a <laughs> sauce from it. Yeah, you can eat the like when you chew those little the flesh and there's a little seed in there. You can eat that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Okay. Not too bad. Not <laughs> 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 too bad. They had to. Um, so I'm just going to end on um, stress management because obviously um, I think that's the other thing that we kind of underestimate how stress really does impact the body, impact the immune system, impact the brain. Um, I do a lot of work in my practice on stress management and adrenal function and you know regulating the stress response, um, especially when you think about what we're being dealt with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we look at computers and cell phones and all the electronic magnetic um, devices as well as just day-to-day -day stress. Um, but you know, looking at some of these things and making sure that you are getting some of this into your daily routine, um, whether it's a massage once a month, whether it's going for a walk and doing some deep breathing, whether it's doing some yoga poses, um, whether it's taking a bath or <clears throat> meditation, um, I think also we underestimate um, how meditation can really um, do wonders for the body and wonders for the mind and also um, protect the immune system as well. Um, some of the resources, if you want to learn a little bit more about naturopathic medicine and what we do as naturopathic doctors, I did put up the BCNA and the CAND um, website. So they list all of the um, licensed naturopathic doctors. Um, BCNA is for BC, CND um, regulates the whole of Canada. Uh, I actually also put up Inspire Health. I don't know if anyone's heard of Inspire Health before. Um, but Inspire Health, um, I know that they used to charge a membership fee, but now it's free. The government subsidizes it. And what it is, it's a non-for-profit organization. Um, they work with the um, Canadian Cancer Society. And they have nutritionists. They've got yoga instructors. They've got all these um, 
practitioners there that are there to help support you through and, and your families if you're going through um, treatment if you're trying to decide you know what route to do if you have questions just like the prostate center does um, so this is a nice adjunct that actually will work with and there's medical doc doctors there's a whole bunch of medical doctors on staff too and they will also work with um, naturopathic doctors as well so I think that's a really good step in the right direction because they're really trying to amalgamate all facets right not just conventional medicine which definitely has its place but also supportive like nutrition deep breathing meditation all of exercise all of those things as well uh, to learn more about environmental toxins I put some um, resources there too and just some healthy eating um, websites nourishing meals and then a good cookbook for decreasing inflammation um, with some really yummy recipes in there too um, by Julie Danilot some meals that heal inflammation so that concludes my presentation, and I think we have a few questions. <laughs> Can I ask you uh, what you know about the importance of blood counts on fighting cancer and what you can do to get blood counts up? So true. white blood cell count, you mean? Uh, red and white. Mm -hmm. So I would probably look at all your antioxidant um, protective properties, but having said that, I know with a lot of conventional um, treatments with regards to chemo and radiation, they often aren't suggesting that you do any kind of antioxidant therapies. So usually after um, a patient has gone through their, um, their treatments, I'll usually will suggest like IV vitamin C's or oral vitamin C or green tea extract where there's a lot of things that will help to boost that immune response. And even actually having said that, the mistletoe injections um, will do that and they can be taken, um, I believe, through radiation and chemotherapy. My blood counts are very low. Mm -hmm. They're below, below the bottom of the range. And I can't get them up. Yeah. But I would also look at like if you're not already working with a nutritionist, like look at you know what you're eating in your diet because we know that something as simple as sugar can really depress your white blood cell counts. I mean, so I'm no sugar and I'm on a raw vegan diet. Oh wow, look at you. So maybe it's just so taking we, some time for your immune system to respond. If someone is diagnosed with cancer, prostate or any other kind of cancer, one of their early decisions would be naturopathic treatment or traditional medicine, correct? Or is it a combination of the two? It, I've seen both. Mm -hmm. I've seen, I've treated patients that have come to me after they've gone through chemo and radiation and, there's, and it, they still have the cancer. And so basically the next step is, I'm sorry, there's, we keep doing chemo and radiation, but usually in, the, in those cases the oncologists are saying, okay, well, there's not much more we can do for you. And so I've had cases where people are coming to me as a last resort, which is very, very difficult because, you know, you're throwing everything you got at it, but the body is so, you know, is so depleted. Um, I have had cases where, um, I have, I'm working with an oncologist or I'm working alongside. Um, in some cases, if it's a little bit um, too complicated, because I wouldn't say cancer is like at my forefront as far as a specialty of mine, um, but there are some excellent naturopathic doctors that I will consult with. Um, I have an excellent um, colleague that um, specializes in cancer on the mainland um, that I will consult with as well, or I will just refer on. Yeah. What's your perception of uh, post-surgery testosterone treatment? Yeah, it's kind of a can of worms. Um, I think if you're being monitored really, really closely, and say you do the metabolite testing, right? So you're making sure that you're you're not converting the testosterone into estrogen. You're not converting the testosterone into DHT. You're keeping it in healthy, normal amounts and you're looking at the dose, like you're starting at a lower dose, then I think that's a possibility. But it's something that you definitely want to work with your healthcare provider on, which you would have to anyway because you have to get a prescription for it. Yeah, and we're, um, I should mention, 
as naturopathic physicians, um, testosterone is not within our scope of practice. So we can modulate it as far as like give herbs to make sure that it's being metabolized in the right way, but we can't prescribe testosterone, we can't change your prescription, it's not, um, at this time it's not within our scope. Yet, we can prescribe um, antibiotics and antidepressants and statins and, and heart medications, but we just, testosterone is not one thing that we can, yeah. Not yet. Yes. Um. A lot of the prostate cancer treatment, the conventional stuff, is has got a lot of science behind it. Studies mm -hmm. so these things you're recommending. How much science is there behind it? Well, I put down a lot of the the things that were cited, um, and there is quite a lot of study. There are a lot of studies that um, that have been done with some of them. Um, but the problem is, is that there's not a lot of research that's going or money that and yeah, research is I going understand. in that direction. So that's why when people are like, well, how come there's no research on, you know, this or that or these herbs or these vitamins, it's, you know, it's the funding. You know, a lot of the funding, the cancer um, funding will go into definitely awareness and, and education, um, but a lot of it will go into um, medications as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for the information. I've jotted as much as I can. Mm -hmm. My question is, is there a possibility of getting a hard copy of that? I think it's going to be, um, <coughs> excuse it me, is, it's going to be on that. It is being videoed, and you'll see the slides mm -hmm. as part of the video. Uh, I don't really want it on video, I don't. I'm not a computer whiz or technical whiz or anything. <laughs> That's why I was asking for a hard copy. Mm -hmm. um, I could probably arrange turning it into a PDF and probably making it available. Yeah. <laughs> or at least putting it in the, at the census library. Yeah, that's an idea. If I sent you my presentation, like if I sent it to the prostate center, would you be able to? Yes, you're getting a yes from. If one is diagnosed with a particular type of cancer, say prostate cancer, is that pretty well assured that cancer is going to appear elsewhere in the body? Not always. No. What, what's the no. ideal number for PSA? I, I wouldn't know. I, wouldn't know. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think it's hard to say, well, you should ultimately get your PSA at, to this number. I think, it's, I think it's different for every individual. I think it depends on the stage of the cancer. I think it depends on the trend that you're seeing. There's, there's, so, there's too many factors that are involved. At least, so. it's, at least it's seven or less. No, no, the PSA test, the doubling time is way more important than the yeah, in, in my view. That's a question yeah, right back there, too. Um, I don't necessarily have any question. What I'd like to speak to is one of the resources that you have up there, Inspire Health. Yes. I'm currently involved with their programs, and I cannot speak highly enough of what they do. Excellent. They have some excellent, excellent people there. Um, Doctors, counselors, nutritionists, exercise, support groups, just all kinds of things. <coughs> the only downfall that I can speak to them about is there's no men. <laughs> so if you guys want to come and join me, please. <laughs> That's why I mentioned it. They're in the But they are. They really are a good, and good group. Um, my cooking okay. lesson this afternoon spoke on turmeric and all these anti inflammatories, and they, they just reinforce what you're saying. This may be a good place to stop. Somebody has indicated a very strong, positive response to uh, your work. And uh, you'll be here for a few minutes yet. You have a burning question that you need to have answered before she has to leave. Maybe she'd take a minute or two to do that. But thank you so very much for a very entertaining and interesting. Of our uh, 